stunning. And we got some of the most gorgeous shots. It was a clear day. The whole Mo Rocky Mountain range was in the background. It was just stunning. And oh. it was one of the most life-giving things I had experienced in a really long time. And I was like, I have got to make more time for this because it just lifted my soul in a way that I hadn't felt in weeks or months. Mm -hmm. What serendipity, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. My husband and I took the camera out um, a couple of weeks ago. We're just seeing fall pass in California and it, it's actually here about three weeks. So, um, so you got, you got to get with it and get out and see, you know, the colors. And we just saw some, so many gorgeous trees and we saw one that we would have never noticed if we just not been really looking for it. The top of the tree was a totally different color than the lower, say three quarters of the tree. I guess it's the kind of tree that does that but you have to be alert to seeing in a different way, having a perspective of allowing for surprises and for beauty and um, creativity out there. And then sometimes I bring that home and the thoughts are still with me and I still create you know, from it in a different way. Words, colors, mm -hmm. in that fashion. Yeah, I had a great time coming back and just playing around with the photos and editing them and cropping them and they just were stunning. It just was a really beautiful time. Do you have a white Christmas? Do you think you'll have a white Christmas this year? In Denver, it really depends. We often have a white Easter more than we do a white Christmas. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> that's usually when we'll get our biggest storm, it's typically, you know, that we'll have storms on Easter more than Christmas. But a lot of, a lot of years we'll get a little flurry or so on Christmas Eve. Yeah. I'm going to pause for just a moment and acknowledge that I thought this was recording from the beginning and it was not. And I just started recording a few minutes ago. And oh. so for the benefit of those who are watching this later, um, you missed about 15 minutes <laughs> oh. of the opening of this. That was really good stuff. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you have to read the article in BNG about it. Uh, but uh, welcome to those who are joining us later uh, to our panelists. And uh, I'll say more at the end to sort of recap that. But you've joined the conversation in progress, and it's a great conversation uh, that you're. While going you're to talking about uh, tactile, uh, this is what I made today. Uh, I'm sitting in the kitchen right now, and I had quite the production line. Um, these are peanut butter balls, very similar to uh, the uh, Buckeyes that I cover the whole. And uh, I can't show you the chocolate ones because I'm allergic to chocolate. So I work in a mask and gloves. But uh, when I was at St. Luke's in Kansas City, there were times I'd come home from the grief group at night and then do peanut butter balls. And, you know, people get on my list. Am I still on your list? And you don't think about a thanatologist making peanut butter balls. <laughs> but uh, this is something I can do. I can't cook, but I can make peanut butter balls. And <laughs> hundreds of them. Well, that's yeah. a good reminder that uh, from everything I think we know now, uh, sharing baked goods uh, is okay. Uh, because particularly with the passage of time, uh, if, you're, if you're passing them off through the mail or something, um, you know, the, more and more the, the, we're looking at the airborne transmission uh, than the surface tra transmission and food itself seems to generally be safe. And you know, that's one of the major changes in grief that has happened in this country. Um, and, and among many African-American families, the fact it's homemade, has a special ring to it. Uh, now we tend to stop at the deli. I'll take a pound of that, uh, this and that. And um, you know, one, one church I worked with shall remain nameless. They had the official church funeral cookbook and every Sunday school class in that huge church, you had to serve the exact same thing. You know, those little green beans with the uh, cream of mushroom soup and onion rings on top. Yeah. Some of the most boring funeral meals you can imagine, but they didn't want anybody um, feeling like they were special. I went, yeah, nobody's special. It's all awful. <laughs> but that sense of, um, and one thing I learned from widows, uh, it's awful easy to show up with a big casserole dish. Hey, I made this casserole dish. And they talked about how much food they threw out. Would it be possible you could put that in small containers and when I come home from work or something, there's just about the right amount I need to eat. Mm -hmm. And that was news to me. I had never thought through that, uh, but I learned that from widows. Mm -hmm. 
that's a beautiful, beautiful world uh, word. Laurie, would you like to add to that, maybe? Yeah, I, I'm. I am so intrigued with the relationship between art and grief. Mm. As all of you know, grief has no words. Mm. There are no words to describe the depth of the pain and the devastation when you lose someone you love. One of the things that we've done every year, one of the sacrifices we've made because we're on all of our groups are on Zoom right now, is including art in our groups. Um, and we had a client this past week in one of our groups say that she really missed meeting in person right now because she knew they would make something as a memorial for their loved one here during the holidays. Mm. Um, we, we make one thing in particular, it's a little little cheap votive tea, tea candle holder, right? A little votive candle holder. And the clients choose, we've done this with four-year-olds through 99-year-olds. Wow. <clears throat> the clients, we have all kinds of tissue paper, all colors. They choose the colors that represent their loved one, whatever memory they have. And they use, uh, we just have all this uh, 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 glue, the, the, the glue and stuff available for them, the special glue. And they can make, design their, tear their tissue paper and put it on their little votive candle holder wow. and, um, and, and put another coat on it when it's, uh, when it's done. And um, so one of, the, one of the young women that was in our, uh, that's still in our uh, millennial group, our young adult group, said her first meeting two years ago when she came, she walked in and saw all the votive candle holders and the tissue paper. And she thought, oh my gosh, this is not going to be good. I cannot believe this is what we're going to do. She carries that with her. Her brother had died. Mm -hmm. She takes that votive candle holder with her home every holiday and lights a can that candle in memory of her brother. Our children have done the same things, our four-year-olds. It's just such a simple project, but there's no words. There are no words. And some people are introverted and some people are extroverted and some people are instrumental grievers and they're gonna process their grief through their thoughts. And some people are intuitive grievers and they process through their feelings. Mm -hmm. I found, especially for the instrumental grievers who aren't gonna, they're, they're processing. They don't have anything to share yet because they haven't processed, even in our groups, for them to be able to have the time to pick colors and do art, um, that takes the pressure off of them to have to have the words. You know, um, it's just beautiful. It's, it's just, it's just wonderful. I worked with a four-year-old who lost her uncle. Um, he, he actually was a homicide victim. And um, she adored him, adored him. And, and so she, she wrote a story with me and drew pictures about when the last thing she did with her uncle was go to the state fair. And you talk about a four-year-old that recalled all memories and, and wrote, drew pictures. You know, it's just amazing. So art and grief are so genuinely, genuinely um, uh, blended. Um, and it's such a healing process and a, and a and a process, you know? So I really appreciate the, the ideas and things that we get sent and that we can read about. I can't make up the idea, but I can follow directions, so. Yeah. That's a beautiful story, Laurie, really beautiful. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, the associated thing to that, and Amber, you might be the best one to start this conversation with us, is what is the role of music in a time of isolation mm -hmm. like this? Um, and particularly with the holidays when we associate so much with music and people normally go to concerts and recitals and special mm -hmm. events and you play, you play Christmas music at home and in the car and all that. And you're a musician. Uh, what do you think about that? I think it's, it's, music is another form of art. And just like you were saying, Lori, I think it, it allows us to express our grief in a way that um, we may not be able to do with words, but we can find it in the words of another person. Uh, we can find it in music that doesn't have words and somehow it allows us to process um, and let go of things in a way that we maybe don't quite even understand ourselves yet, but that hits us on a very deep level. And, and I think even using music throughout the holidays, we can't obviously go to concerts this year and plays and all that kind of thing like we normally would, but being able to just enjoy those things in the home, you know, I, when I was growing up, whenever it snowed, I would wake up to my mom playing Tennessee Christmas by me Grant in the house. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that's still very nostalgic for me. So every time it snows, I like to get up and, you know, turn that on and play it. And I think music just as a whole is, it can be a very healing um, form of art that can really be instrumental in our, 
in, in our process of healing. There is a lot of nostalgia, particularly around the holidays with music, isn't there? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It evokes yeah. memories, probably both good and bad, uh, depending on your experience. Uh, sure. What does yeah. someone else think about music? Mm. This came up in our spouse partner loss group Wednesday night. And um, a couple of the people in the group said that they can't listen to music right now. And others said that they listen to it because they know their grief builds up and builds up and builds up and builds up and they need to get it out. So when they feel so, when they become so filled with grief, they turn on music and the tears flow and they get it out and it's cleansing. It, it's amazing. Hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's really good. Harold, were you gonna say something? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, if you look historically how many great pieces of music or art have been done uh, based on um, a loss in the life of the, uh, of the individual artist. For example, the great sculptor in Washington DC of Clover Adams, who suicided, she was a great photographer when she discovered her husband was having an affair in Washington society. And uh, he commissioned this incredible piece of art, probably 12 foot tall, but that's where Eleanor Roosevelt went, went when she was depressed. She mm. would go sit in front of that piece of art. It's called grief. Mm. Um, and it is stunning, the impact it has on you. But it was very important to Eleanor. She'd go there and sit, look at that art. She knew something of the story. And um, all kinds of art like that that's just so important. Mm -hmm. um, even if it's not our particular taste, or you go, well, I got to kind of close one eye and look. But yeah. Um, what it does, it's that language that's so critically important to some individuals. And if nothing else, sometimes it opens a conversation. What, what do you think that means? And what do you see when you see this? Um, very important. Well, that's a good word. Yes. I think what art does uh, and music is it validates what's inside us. Mm. So when we yeah. see this piece of sculpture or hear of music or do art, it, it makes what we're experiencing in our heart um, real. And in the case of art, it makes it visible. So to bring that feeling to a different um, level of expression makes it more meaningful, I think. Hmm. Well, and, and certainly uh, many of the kinds of art that you, that you produce uh, that are uh, visible, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like, like the card I was showing earlier, and that's something that you hold on to, right? Hopefully. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because it, it's, it's, it lasts longer than just right. the moment in which it's received. I mean, I think most of it still, I do. I still have my grandmother's handwriting. She would write out little recipes and notes. And, you know, I come across those every now and then. And it's just wonderful to see her handwriting again, even though she never intended for me to keep it. Um, I have, and, and it's very, you know, it's a very good feeling, good experience. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a, so just a, a personal testimony here. Um, I, I'm not a great, uh, I'm horrible at drawing and uh, don't, can't letter well, uh, but uh, my wife and I have been married 35 years and every Valentine's Day, save one of those 35, uh, I have made a handmade Valentine card for her uh, mm -hmm. which she still has, you know, the, the, the stack of them uh, stashed away. They're, they are so simple. You know, I, I, I would like go to the uh, uh, construction paper uh, thing at the, at the children's supply room at the church and get some red and pink and I would cut out the pieces that I wanted and glue them on. <laughs> <laughs> and use a sharpie for the lettering. <laughs> <laughs> it works, right? It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't. Right. That is right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we can learn from history. Uh, and I, I know each of you has a bit of a different um, angle on this, uh, perhaps. Uh, and Harold, this certainly plays into your, um, your wheelhouse, uh, for sure. I mean, it's so easy to say, well, we've never been in a time like this before. And probably most of us have never been in a time like this before, but there have been other times like this before, just different perhaps. What can we learn from the past about how to cope in the present? 
Well, my mind immediately goes to what was going on. Um, let's see, I think it would be 188 years ago tonight, uh, Andrew Jackson had been elected president of the United States. He believed he had been elected in 1824 and the election was stolen from him. Mm -hmm. So he won in 1828 and was excited because he, I've gotten what was coming to me now. And uh, there were a lot of scandal uh, rumors about his wife because they had been married um, and were technically bigamist uh, because they did not know that the state legislature had not granted a divorce. So when Rachel went into Nashville to pick out gowns for the inaugural and for living in the White House, she heard some of those rumors, came back, had a massive heart attack at the uh, Hermitage and died on the 22nd of December and was buried on the 24th, uh, Christmas Eve. And we think of Andrew Jackson as this tough guy. I mean, he killed people, shot people in duels, but his heart was totally broken by that experience to the point he said, I don't know if I can go to Washington without her. And several people said, you were elected, you know, she was your wife, you've got to go do this. Uh, much the same in 1924, when the Calvin Coolidge's had a son die uh, in the White House from blood poisoning. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating because they were not emotional people. But what I learned at the Hoover uh, Presidential Library is on Christmas Eve, they gathered around the piano and sang their 16-year-old son's favorite Christmas carols, mm. uh, which I found absolutely fascinating that they would do that. And of course, one of our great songs, you know, uh, was written by Irving Berlin uh, at the height when the casualties uh, and fatalities in World War II were skyrocketing in late 1944. And he wrote that great song about, uh, you know, I fall asleep counting my blessings. Mm -hmm. And just an incredible song um, that I've mm -hmm. used in counseling with lots of people. But out of that music, out of that pain, uh, historically, and of course, uh, 102 years ago, we were in the, uh, the Spanish flu epidemic. And the same things we were doing were did, outdoor funerals, churches closed, all those kind of things that happened. Uh, the death count was uh, horrible, 750,000 in the United States. But um, what the sad thing was is they made this decision. And of course they had the deaths in World War I and the Spanish flu epidemic. And America made the decision to forget that. As a matter of fact, Warren G. Harding ran for president on back to normalcy. Let's get back to normalcy. And you know, when I talked about that iceberg, this is one of the lethal things that happened in, um, in you know, World War I and which was simultaneous to the epidemic. You can't sweep grief under the uh, rug. And uh, just a, one more personal thing. I learned this as a little boy. My grandfather died on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. And I've often said no one's grandfather, no child's grandfather should die on Christmas Eve. And yet that's what happened. And we sat for two days, including Christmas Day, in a dark, small, rural funeral home in Indiana. And of course, there was nothing open. Uh, so you couldn't go to a restaurant because it was Christmas Day. And uh, it was a horrible experience. And I am sure that funeral home did not look like my memories. But as a small child, all I could think of was darkness mm -hmm. uh, and drabness and I've never forgotten that experience in working with grievers. Well, let me tell you about my Christmas Eve experience. And I think that experience had something to do with me coming to the work that I do, uh, learning that so viscerally. Uh, so yeah, those are some little historical examples of, of what has happened, yeah. So before anyone, I wanna want just interject one thing we've learned in doing some research this year on churches and the Spanish flu in 1918. And, and we actually ran a story on this a few months ago. Uh, there are very few church records of the Spanish flu. Mm. Most churches have no mention of it in their histories, no mention of it in their documents. It's not in their archives. We've had archivists looking for information about it. They cannot find it. It's as if it didn't happen. Yes. 
and it's exactly the, the the answer seems to be exactly what you said. They decided they were not going to think about it again. They were just going to move on. World War One, the Spanish flu together was too much. Let's just not talk about it again. Yeah. And you went into the roaring 20s that were the big emotional time and jazz and dance and all that. Uh, but that kind of hangs in there, you know, and they're doing fascinating research at Drew, uh, at Duke, going back and looking the, of the lives of the children who were born immediately after the yellow fever, uh, Spanish flu, and the consequences that those children had. And I think that's going to be happening here. Uh, with children, uh, the nightmares that children are trying to imagine. And, uh, you know, in some of the Hispanic families where you've had five, six, seven people die in the family. And it's kind of like, who's going to be there for me? And those answers aren't always good. I, I did a funeral a few months ago for someone, a, a beloved person uh, who was born in 1919. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do the math, you figure out that she had to have been conceived uh, during the Spanish flu outbreak. Yeah. And uh, it struck me what a tremendous amount of faith those parents had to have yes. to bring a child into the world in the midst of a global pandemic yes. at that time, yeah. right? Yeah. Someone else with an observation on what we need to learn from history. I didn't realize it um, until we were just talking. I, I, I guess I knew it in the back of my mind, but it just popped out when Harold was talking. I was 10, 11, 12 years old when John uh, Kennedy and Jacqueline Booby R. Kennedy were in the White House. And I remember them announcing she was pregnant and then she lost the baby. Patrick Booby R. Kennedy, I can tell you his name. Yes. I mourn that. Mm -hmm. And that's my first recollection probably of really mourning and, and grieving because um, I'd not had any family deaths. That was my first experience. And mm -hmm. then I, I saw this little girl, when little John John, I watched the parade in black and white on TV when that little boy saluted his daddy's casket as it passed, I sobbed. And I sobbed again when they took the camera to the gravesite and they did the eternal, uh, the, the eternal flame and, and it showed the processional and it was so formal. And I didn't realize it until Harold was talking, what a profound effect that had on my life and how that probably um, is one of the things that really moved me to this, this profession, ministry, mm -hmm. love, passion that I have. I wanted to go through the screen and hug that little boy. You know, I wanted to be there. Um, and I, I got a real, that was my first real understanding as much as I could understand of what it means to be broken and to lose someone. I projected so much of myself, it became very real to me. It was my loss too, you know? So I, our, our, our society is pretty death avoidant. You know, it doesn't surprise me about the churches and all that. We're death avoidant. We don't talk, talk about it. You know, one of the things that uh, came out of that was the sense of if the president's son can die, getting the best medical care, mm -hmm. what about my child? Yes. And I think it's scared. And you know, it was really hard moment in American history, um, <clears throat> what we believe about prayer, corporate prayer. Cause you can look at like the Kansas City Star had pictures of nuns praying for Patrick Bouvier to live and he died. And so people are going, wait a minute, you got all these nuns praying and this little baby died. And maybe this doesn't, prayer doesn't work the way we think. Mm -hmm. And that was also true with the assassination of William McKinley, um, where he said, thy will be done. Um, and, and, and on this, so what you're saying is important because I believe in a system of antecedents. So when I work with a griever, uh, yes, they're coming generally because of this most recent death, but I want to go back and look at the previous experiences as far back as they remember. And they will often say, oh, that was a long time ago. Yes, but your brain remembers it, it happening. Mm -hmm. And what sometimes they were told and the number of children who have been told, now you, you got to be the big boy, you got to be the man of the family and how we disenfranchise grief and the people who will go through family get-togethers this month and the name will never be mentioned. Whatever you do, don't say the name. Don't, that's just gonna upset everybody. And 
you know, actually it's the silence that really troubles people. Those mm -hmm. antecedents are very important. Very much. I think grief lives in the depth of our soul. I think that's where grief lives and the yes. deepest core of our soul. And it collects as we lose loved ones, it collects. So when the next loved one dies, it stirs the grief from the ones before. And in our society, many times, and Harold, you've had the same experience, obviously, from what you said, people will come and say, my father just died, but I'm grieving my mother too. And I never grieved my mother. Yeah. You know, and it's yeah. a beautiful process when they, it's never too late to grieve. Of course, grief is what happens to us inwardly. Mourning is what they're really talking about to, to really process that and to, to be able to get that grief out to mourn. Um, so it's, it's very pivotal, very important um, for grievers to be able to go back and to reclaim that grief. It's there anyway. And yeah. to process it. it's so important to process it. Really great comments. Uh, before I go to the next question, I want to just say it again to the participants, if any of you would like to ask a question, just type it in in the Q&A box at the bottom, and I'll sort of dole those out uh, as we're able to work them in. Uh, Amber, I, I want to go back to something you said earlier that didn't get captured on the recording that I think is vitally important, and you probably want to say more about it anyway, and, and that is the unique challenge of the pandemic, the isolation and the pandemic holidays on many folks in the LGBTQ community who are either uh, stranded with family members who are not affirming of them or separated from others who are affirming of them and are, are finding difficulty probably two different directions during this time. Would mm -hmm. you say more about that? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, we've got, especially in the very beginning of the pandemic, I had a wave of people reaching out to me saying, you know, I'm suddenly, especially kids who are away at college and that kind of thing, and suddenly they're now quarantined back at home with their family where they're not able to be safe, they're not able to be out. Um, and that caused a lot of turmoil for them um, because maybe they were able to be out at college, but suddenly they're not, and now they're quarantined at home and we have no idea how long this is gonna last. And um, I think that has been a great challenge for a lot of LGBT people. Um, many people, not even necessarily young people, but um, I've talked to quite a few even middle-aged people that have ended up coming out in the midst of this pandemic and um, people who maybe were in a um, mixed orientation marriage and are now coming out and um, you know, trying to grapple with that and how they're going to proceed with kids. And you know, there's just so many layered effects to all that without a pandemic. And then you add that on top of it and the isolation just compounds because you're not able to leave the house. You're not able to go to another place that may feel safe. You're not able to, um, to get together with a friend for coffee and talk about it and decompress. And so I think that's been a great challenge for a lot of LGBT people. And then, like you said, not being able to, to connect with people who really do care about them and really do affirm them, um, you know, going to their affirming church, maybe one of their only safe places that they have. And, and now they are able to do that. And, um, you know, yes, there are things that they can participate in online, um, but there's something about that physical hug, that physical touch that uh, a lot of us are missing. And I've uh, one of the projects that I've launched uh, in the midst of the pandemic is a book club for LGBT people and allies um, who have a faith background. And so we all gather online and it's people from all over the nation and even several countries around the world that have come together and we read a different book together every month have discussion, you know, questions that I post in the private group. And um, then we meet at the end of the month and discuss that and have small group discussions. We bring in the author of the book we're reading and talk about it. Um, but it's been such a beautiful community of people that um, they've really been able to find support in one another in that space. Um, and even in that, in that group, there's been a lot of people who are struggling to come out in the midst of all this and facing a great deal of additional challenges that the pandemic brings with it. Well, that's that's really helpful to hear. I, I think um, any of the other panelists want to speak to that issue. I would add a point, uh, and this is not just with LGBT, but individuals who have uh, are in recovery from mm -hmm. drinking, absolutely, and in the isolation, and mm -hmm. for a significant number of gay men at least, uh, bars were a place they were felt safe to socialize. And of course, with those being closed, it really has. Uh, further that isolation 
And it can be a real risk to people. They've worked so hard for recovery. And now during this time, uh, the stress is so great. It's awful tempting to kind of, well, I'm just gonna have one drink. I, I can handle one drink. Mm -hmm. And that can be all kinds of people actually. Uh, we just, we want to try to medicate the pain rather than walking into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I sometimes tell grievers, <clears throat> they go, I, I can't get over grief. And I go, well, that's, that's interesting. Have you gotten into it yet? Mm -hmm. And there's all kind of like, what? No, well, have you gotten into your grief? And talking about you, you've got to walk that lonesome valley. That's what the song in Appalachia said. And the number of people who will fight anything to dodge the grief, they just will dodge it. And that's like that iceberg. It's going to come back mm -hmm. and it's going to get you. The old Fram Alter filter commercial, you can pay me now or you can pay me later, but you are going to pay. You just really are going to pay. Uh, that's, a, that's a really excellent point, I think. Someone else on any of that? Mark, we call it hugging the cactus is what I call it. <laughs> <laughs> I think the grief is like a cactus. It's very painful. I'm not talking about the little bitty ones, little succulent kind of thing. I'm talking about big major West Texas cactus. Yeah. I ask people to hug the cactus. That is well known around our center. All of our clients have heard this and they'll say, we're hugging the cactus. <laughs> it's so painful. You, we ask our clients, don't just go up and so many people walk around the cactus. They, they try to turn their back on it. They don't hug the cactus. Why? Because it's so painful. And we're taught in our society, you're not supposed to have pain. You're supposed to avoid that. And you're strong. You go buck up and you move on. But we ask our clients to hug the cactus and to hug it as hard as they can. Because somewhere along this journey, that cactus is going to morph into a teddy bear. And it's going to become comforting to them. Grief will become the comfort it's meant to be. It, the intensity of the pain will come down at some point mm -hmm. and they are they end up hugging a teddy bear instead of a cactus but that teddy bear still has thorns from the cactus in it and mm -hmm. on special days special events just because they died you don't you, know, you don't have to have a trigger they died that's a trigger enough at some along the, the rest of your life hugging that little teddy bear you're going to still find thorns, but I can definitely identify with what Harold said because it is definitely hugging a cactus and you have to hug it to get through it. To, to, to grieve, you have to, the only way to, to get through grief is to grieve. The only way to get through the pain is to feel the pain. Yeah. And that take, that's such healthy grief. And that's what takes strength. It takes no strength to walk away. It takes no courage to walk away. So when people in our society say, be strong, they're really meaning buck up and move on. So we're trying to help people understand be strong means hug that cactus. Mm. Hug that cactus. That's, a, that's an image we can remember, I think. <laughs> One thing too uh, that's important is that really when we talk about, we talk a lot about Christmas, but there is a succession of holidays. So you start with Thanksgiving, but then you're in Christmas. And then for some families, New Year's Eve, is a huge celebration, either getting dressed up, going out in past years, or all the bowl games. And as you move toward college games and then into professional games, and you're moving toward Super Bowl Sunday, and before you get there, you've got Valentine's. And you know, if you've ever watched people running the hurdles in a track match, you know, anybody can probably jump over one hurdle if you really work at it. But here's another hurdle and another hurdle and it's this succession of holidays that are really succinct. And then it can also be uh, an anniversary, a birthday, a retirement that are special days too. And it may mean grieving for what you're not going to have. You had planned, we're going to retire and we're going on a cruise in January when there's six inches of snow in Dallas. We're going to be floating in the Caribbean. Uh, no, that's not happening. Uh, either because of death or because we don't have cruise ships now or uh, we're functioning. And so it may have meaning to that. And some in the South, I noticed, are just such diehard athletic fans. It's like the world rises and sets on their particular football team. And so you've got to be able to grieve that as well. Um, 
you know, and even the rivalries and the kidding, the teasing that went on, uh, what are we going to do about Super Bowl Sunday? Yeah. Yeah. So we've got a question from one of our participants. I'm going to get to in just a moment. But before I do that, I, I want to ask one other question. And uh, let's see if a Amber or Fonda, this would be a, something you want to jump in on first. Uh, it seems like uh, the Christmas Day itself is just such a emotion-laden day that it, of all the days of the year. I, I think New Year's Eve, New Year's Day is probably easier to deal with for people than Christmas Day that becomes fraught. And, and but when you can't do the things that you want to do, but you're, you're both really creative people. Have you given thought to ideas for how to do something this year that would make Christmas Day special and memorable? Hmm. I haven't, but I will. <laughs> You've inspired me to to look ahead. I I basically this week just we just got the tree, so that's been my major focus. And um, but that's a good question because I think if we have a plan for it, it makes it easier. And um, you know, for for us, I think it'll probably involve some kind of outdoor walking. Uh, we usually start off the day with a walk and it's amazing how well it goes, you know, when that happens. And um, I don't know, it, I will definitely have some kind of a plan because this, this is a different kind of enjoying the holidays time. Right. And this is not just, it's certainly a real thing for people who are truly alone, but it's also a thing for people who even a, a, a couple uh, who are not with grandchildren who they adore and and maybe have never even met because of the pandemic right it covers a lot of things doesn't it it does yeah amber any ideas on that i would say having a plan definitely makes a big difference you know as somebody that ha is going on nine years now of not having family um i always get really anxious when i don't have a plan uh, and having some kind of plan established always makes me feel um, just more secure and more grounded I don't know that I've thought specifically about um, Christmas Day this year, but I think about the season as a whole and um, the importance of checking in on people more than ever before. You know, I, I always really encourage people to, to reach out to LGBT people who don't have family or who have been excluded from their families. But I think this year more than ever, we need to be checking in on people, um, not just LGBT people, but just you know, people in recovery, those that we love. So many people are grieving on so many different levels right now. It may be the physical loss of somebody due to COVID. It may be the loss of health. It may be the loss of a relationship. It may be the loss of um, you know, children they aren't able to have. It may, I mean, there's so many different layers of grief and loss, um, the loss of a job or the, you know, like there's just, everybody is being affected in different ways. And I think checking in on one another, I think my wife and I are gonna set up um, plates and go out and deliver them to a bunch of our um, people that we haven't been able to see in so long and just leave them on their doorstep and wave from a distance and you know, just spread some Christmas cheer that way because I think so many people have either been alone or even as a couple, like you said, been alone for so long. My wife and I have been, you know, quarantined for almost nine months together now, and we've only seen one other couple for the last nine months because, you know, my health is very critical and we've just only had one other bubble buddy that we've seen on occasion. And so um, your world just feels very small after a while. And I think really, you know, taking care of one another is very important in this season. Yeah. And in past years, we've even done things like um, setting out stuff for the UPS and the FedEx deliveries who are coming, you know, in this season more frequent than ever and yeah. setting out drinks and, and snacks on our porch for them to pick up as they go by and, and to keep them going um, through the season. So those are things that we've kind of done over the years to be creative and, and kind of spread joy. But I think, you know, checking in on one another is important this year. Yeah. One thing I've done, well, go ahead. Matt. No, I was just gonna say, please jump in. Um, I have been emphasizing three little letters this year. N-T-Y. And people say, well, what's that mean? Not this year. Not this year. 
because I think there's a, you know, the, I, I was listening last night of the upsurge in purchasing real Christmas trees. And what's that about? Well, some nostalgia, what going to the lot, all that stuff. But I think there's a temptation for some people, oh, we had such wonderful Christmases. And, and you can almost just code it with nostalgia. And you're not really saying, yeah, but there were some real issues at some of those family gatherings. But this year, this is what we can do. Now, next year, hopefully, we're going to go back to the old tradition. But this year, this is what we can do. So we're not going to be with grandparents, not this year. And give people permission to mourn for the holidays that they so love. You know, because it, it affects all of us. That Our sense, you, you smell certain things cooking, uh, all the foods of this holiday, and so it's awful easy to get nostalgia, almost like the Jews did. And, uh, whoa, man, we were eating well when we were in Egypt. And now we're in this manna stuff. And, uh, you know, but yeah, well, maybe, but not this year. Just, it's not this year, but it's not permanent, but not this year. Well said. Well said. Well, that's a good lead in to the next question. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna set this up. This is a question from one of our participants that ultimately is about uh, guilt in a sense for not being able to do something that would have made a different outcome, you think, right? And we all play that what if game, you know, and if this had happened and that not happened, right? So the question is, how can I counsel a young woman who lost her father during the summer because time ran out before he could get a transplant, probably it was delayed because of the pandemic. And she said several times to me that her dad never got the chance to hear her sing in the church choir. Her parents lived out of state and only visited occasionally. And how can this person offer consolation to the friend who is grieving lost opportunity uh, that was probably worsened by the pandemic? You know, I would like to offer that she write him a letter and just share her feelings of what she would have liked for it to be. Mm -hmm. Involve him in her, uh, her emotions and um, just have that, uh, that expression. Yeah, that's nice. I, at St. Luke's, ask people to consider writing a letter and going to the grave and reading it aloud. And uh, you don't have to tell anybody, but I do tell them you need to take somebody with you in case it becomes much more emotional. They don't have to stand there right by you, but at least you're not going to be heading out in traffic after that experience. But, you know, it's, it's um, auditioning the words in a sentence. Mm -hmm. Say, here's what I wish I could have said to you. I think, too, it's a very close identity between regret and guilt. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about people who made promises. Uh, I will be there. You know, I will always be there for you. And now the hospital said, no, you're not going to be there. We'll hold them up, you know, a picture of a phone. And so they replay that over and over. I, but I promised. And I've said to some, you know, yes, you did. And that was a great promise. But the circumstances have changed radically. And this was the best you could do. And I, I think a lot of people, it's gonna be a, it's, it's, it's almost a pseudo grief. I, I, I should have been there, I should have done this. And regret is a, such a huge part of grief, uh, especially with uh, traumatic deaths that are so hard to understand. If, if we had left five minutes earlier or five minutes later, we wouldn't have been in the intersection. And some grievers really good get good at um, bogging down in that. Mm. And to say, at the time, I did the best I could. And I have even asked some, okay, you, I've listened to what you've had to say, and it's very fascinating. Now, what would your father say to you? If, if he heard you, what would he say to you? Um, and with some people of faith, I have said, you know, these worlds are not so far apart. Uh, there are those thin places that happen when eternity and earth are in close proximity and who knows that they don't hear. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so to say, and don't worry what people are going to say, because people who haven't been there are not going to be very wise. And until they've walked the walk you've walked, they're, they won't understand. And, and by you doing this, it may be an aha, aha moment for them a year or five years from now. You know, Joan, when her dad died, this is something she did. And I thought she'd lost her mind, but you know, it's not bad. Mm-hmm. I have told people, and uh, this got some eyebrows at St. Luke's, uh, you know, during the holidays, what about taking a couple cookies that you made, homemade cookies, put them in baggies? and take them to the cemetery, you know? And you would have fed them cookies, why not do that? And people go, well, what will people say? Well, you can't live your grief based on what people say, because some people have no earthly idea what you're experiencing. Wow, beautiful. I would thank, I would thank the questioner for walking this journey with this young woman. Mm. It mm-hmm. takes a brave person um, who's not afraid to make mistakes and to, is willing to learn how to walk alongside somebody, somebody who's grieving. Um, so thank you for being there for her and for opening the door for her to be able to be comfortable enough and trust you enough to share this with her, uh, with you. Um, one of the hardest things I've learned, and I, I, I relapse. I'm telling you, I relapse. One of the hardest things I've, I've learned is I'm not responsible for the outcome. I can't fix things. Mm. I, I can't fix it. And so there's no way in this situation you can go back and fix it. And there's no way that she can go back and sing for her daddy like she wants to. Mm. However, there's always plan B. Mm. And there's always a way to try to fulfill that need um, in a different way. I immediately thought about her sending in her sanctuary of her church and singing to her father the sacredness of herself in the sanctuary, singing a song to her daddy. Go to the grave and sing to her daddy. Yes. Take, take a recording and play it at his grave. Um, this week, um, we've got a little boy who's eight. His daddy was murdered a year and a half ago. At, at, he wanted, at Valentine's Day, we were still meeting in person and the kids wanted to make Valentine's. So he made a Valentine for his daddy the next day, his mother took him to the cemetery and he put the valentine on his daddy's grave and left it for him. The, the people in the cemetery, the, the people that take care of the grounds, cleaned up the cemetery. He, and she was so afraid to go back. They not only kept his little valentine on his daddy's grave, they had a rock on top of it so it wouldn't fly away. And this little boy has already told his mama that he wants to get a Christmas tree and put on his daddy's grave and decorate a Christmas tree. So she's doing that. Good. It's never too late to do it. It's never too late. Can we go back and recreate actually him being there in physical body? No, you know, we want to, and we want to tell the reasons why, and he understands, blah, blah, you know, all those things are wonderful and true, but what she has a need to do is sing for her daddy, mm-hmm. you know, so go to that sanctuary, light a candle, and let her sing with all of her heart for her daddy. You know, yeah. that, we, we just do the closest thing we can to it. So there are ways to do it all, you know. But, but thank you so much for walking alongside this young woman and, and for just being there for her. Um, it's amazing. Thank you. And in Spanish, and this is kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm skating out thin ice, but there's the word acompañero. And accompaniara, uh, Yana, and the one who accompanies us, which is the great tide of the paraclete of the Holy Spirit, and one who walks alongside us. I've got to tell a quick story. It's all right. My aunt just had her 94th birthday, and she was Pentecost- as Pentecostal. But uh, her main outlet, since her husband died about 10 years ago, is going to nursing homes and singing for the old people because they need so much help. <laughs> and I go, and Ellen, you're 94. <laughs> yeah, but those old people, they, they don't get many visitors. And this has been hard on her in COVID that they have not been able to go to the nursing homes to sing. Right. This has bothered her so much because every week she was in the nursing home, loving on people and singing, and she can't do that. 
and it's really been difficult for them. Well, as, as we head to our wrap up here on a fascinating and riveting conversation, um, I, I wanna give each of you one last opportunity uh, to say anything that you wanted to say, but I haven't asked the right question or uh, you've not had the right opportunity, but what is, what is the, the, the other brilliant thing that you have that uh, would contribute to our conversation on pandemic holidays? Mm. Closing, closing arguments. <laughs> I think if we can step away from this time, it just as, and view it as a visitor. Uh, I did this with words when I was, um, uh, when I was an editor, one of my highlights of my uh, time there was to get the Oxford Dictionary's word of the year. And, um, this year, I understand there's been something like 600 new words that we've all been um, been reading in the newspaper, hearing, et cetera. Even in our isolation, we've had an abundance of words. And so to step away from this and say, you know, I think I'll remember this um, all my life. We really won't. And we will forget all of the terms that just seem so strange. I happen to have my little word cloud here. It's in my article. Yeah. So uh, these things, we the people, the vaccine, vote six feet apart, uh, coast to coast marches, all of the things that made up this year, I think are really important to write down. Make it a little piece of art if you want, but record it somehow because I'm sure most of us down the road We'll look back, at least if your memory's like mine, and go, you know, what was it that we called that? Or, you know, what was the, the way that we looked at this? And if we write it down now, um, if we make memories of what this time is, good and bad, I think it'll be valuable to us down the road. Beautiful, beautiful. Someone else with a closing thought? I agree. I think we just need to be creative. You know, this is a season that will pass. It won't always be be like this and just finding ways to to embrace this for the season that it is and be creative and finding ways to remember like you like you said I'm uh, encouraging people to do like a, a front porch photo shoot and wear your masks and wear your you know bring your hand sanitizer and your toilet paper and have all those things out to kind of mark this year because that's something you'll always be able to look back on and remember um, you know you can still do volunteer opportunities I know that's something that's uh, usually big around the holidays and there's a lot of virtual opportunities where you can volunteer virtually and still get involved you know I think it just takes being creative and thinking outside the box a little bit um, you know things that maybe you can't go out and and see a concert but you can decorate a gingerbread home at, at the house or go sledding or you know just things that maybe aren't in your norm but that can still bring great memories for you this year so just encourage you to think outside of the box and, and do something different yeah. Well, I, I am stunned by a song I heard recently, and I can't tell you who wrote the song, but the title is Supermarket Flowers. And it's about a man cleaning out his mother's apartment after her death. And there are those, he'd stop at a supermarket, get a bouquet of flowers and throw them away. But in that song is this incredible phrase, a broke heart is a heart that's been loved. And I wish I knew who wrote that because it's just the most one, a broke heart is a heart that's been loved. And uh, you probably find it on YouTube. It's called Supermarket Flowers. Wow, that's a great word. Yeah. Lori? I think a lot of you who are watching right now or who will watch in the next few days, um, all that we've talked about, um, I wanna be sure that you know that you are loved. Uh, you are not alone. We feel your pain. You may feel very alone, especially with the pandemic, but please know our hearts are with you. You are not alone. And it's not a question of can you get through the holidays? You are getting through the holidays. You are doing it. But more than anything, please just remember that you are loved and you are not alone. Our hearts join with you wherever you are. Whoever you are, whatever you've lost, whoever you've lost, we have pulled you into our hearts. 
-hmm. and we will hold on to you and you may feel hopeless you may feel like you have no hope look at your hope keepers everyone on this screen is a hope keeper for you and one day when you don't even realize you're doing it you're going to take your hope back but until then, you've got hope keepers who love you, who only care for you. So just know that you're not alone. Yeah. We love you and we care for you. Well, thank you each for this beautiful conversation. So helpful. And I feel like we've all learned uh, some wonderful ideas. We've all been encouraged and inspired tonight. And uh, what a wonderful collection of uh, con contributions we've had here tonight. And again, this will be archived on our uh, BNG website and other places. Uh, we'll have a report on this in our in, in our news coverage as well. And uh, I, I, I welcome anyone who's watching to reach out if you'd like to uh, get in touch with any of our panelists. I'd be glad to help make that connection for you uh, or to answer any questions uh, that, that you may have. And uh, thank you each and all, and we'll say good night. Uh, at, at, at this point. So glad to have you all with us tonight. Thank you. Thank good you. night. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye, guys. Bye.